and I, in real life, had these two friends, a woman and a man, who we had fixed up. And when we fixed them up, they started to get along really well and go out. It was working out really nicely. And we thought that we were geniuses because we had done this great matchmaking, you know. Then the relationship started to go badly, and Lelaine and I started to blame each other for what happened with their relationship. And that was, we thought, so we were looking for an episode, so we pitched that idea. Larry and Jerry liked that idea. We ran off and literally in a day or two wrote a first draft of that episode. George was in rare form. He just can't find anybody. I know, Cynthia too. She's really giving up. George too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I've never fixed anybody up. Oh, me neither. And I am not about to start with George. <laughs> Around the time of the fix-up um, is, <laughs> is when Jason's physicality became George's physicality and became fodder for comedy. This was suddenly, you know, so he's fat. No, he's strong. And um, what else? What else? Oh, right, um, uh, well... He's he's kind of just kind of mm, losing his hair. He's bald. No. no, no, no. He's not bald. He's balding. <laughs> so he will be bald. Yeah. George has been put in some pretty compromising uh, sexual positions and some pretty embarrassing nudity or near nudity. And I, you know, Larry would always kind of look at me and go, and I mean, you know. I'm, I'm with you. I'm down with the program, um, but that was a, that was a, the beginning of the change of uh, okay, Jason can take the the shots too, so we can have some fun here, you know, playing with my physicality and and uh, um, you know and how to, uh, whether I could you know whether I was willing to be a sexual buffoon, um, which I was more than willing. <laughs> <laughs> to be, because it was fun. When Amy Time rolled around, I think I submitted the subway or whatever, but Elaine submitted the fix-up. I think it was maybe her only, or one of two produced episodes that she had. Sure enough, the fix-up got nominated. And the Emmy goes to Elaine Pope and Larry Charles for Seinfeld. And we were in the limo, we didn't know what to do, and I was trying to write a speech. I'd never been to the Emmys and I didn't know what to do. And I wrote this like five minute speech and they go, it's 30 seconds, what are you talking about? You can't use the speech. So we eventually came up with the idea of writing a speech that Jerry, Jerry was gonna give out the award. We wrote a speech that Jerry could read and actually when we won the Emmy, we got up on stage, handed Jerry the speech, Jerry read the speech, and I didn't wind up having to say anything, which was a great relief. Uh, Elaine and Larry have asked me to speak on their behalf as they are too neurotic to handle it. <laughs> I can vouch for that. We would like to thank the cast and crew, especially Larry David, who without with, we would not be granted this honor. Lastly, we pay tribute to a man, Jerry Seinfeld, but not merely a man, more accurately, a god. <laughs> a man of great sexual prowess, <laughs> a fine actor, most significantly humanitarian. Why, just before the ceremony, a little cripple boy came. Oh. Thank, thank you. you. was an idea by Mark Jaffe. Jerry and George get off the plane and take somebody else's limo. And he could never figure out what to do after that. And we sat around and I said, what if it was a neo-Nazi's limo? I mean, again, that's the place that I would go to. The greatest times I had on the show were really the one-on-one -on -one scenes with Jerry. I thought they were the best runs for me and, and, um, and always fun, always really fun to do. And here we had a whole episode, you know, stuck in the back of this, this car. The difficult thing about Seinfeld is I can tell you, I know a lot about Michael. I've spent a lot of time with Michael. I've spent a lot of time with Julia. And I know them really well. I don't know Jerry really well. And the reason is, you know, he, was in, he had one foot in, in two different worlds. He was on set with us, but he was also a producer-writer. And so, you know, he wasn't hanging with us the way everybody else could. Um, so when I would get those episodes where, you know, he and I were kind of together and alone, then all of a sudden, you know, 
you get to know this guy a little bit that you've been hanging out with. And, uh, and that was always a nice time, really nice time. We are going to the Nick game! Michael Jordan! The no! We're going to the Nick game, bro! <laughs> did I tell you? Did I tell you? I can't believe it! <laughs> when we did the limo episode, we had uh, rear screen projection rather than the uh, green screen that we use most of the time. We got a lot of background pictures from New York. But we had to do a, a mob scene on a location. And there's a lovely New York street at Paramount. And so we went to Paramount to shoot that scene. It was at the end of a long day. There was rain in the forecast. And Wayne Kennan and his crew got everything lit and ready to go. And we shot it. And about five minutes after we finished, it started raining. And we got out of there, though. the opportunity to direct that one episode was was one of the great gifts the show gave me because <clears throat> again I my my fantasies were all about the theater and I knew how to direct for the theater and I I had fantasies about directing for the theater never had fantasies of directing anything with a camera and suddenly I found myself in a world where there was four of them hanging around all the time and and the actual set work, you know, not the camera work, but the, the staging of the show was just like staging a piece of theater. The only thing that I remember that was a, a bit of a surprise uh, uh, was that Michael uh, Kramer was, his storyline that he was having epileptic seizures at the sound of Mary Hart's voice. And in one scene, he, he had to have one. And I remember saying to him, Mike, what do you want to do? Because we'll set it up. I mean, what do you, you, know, you need breakaways, desk, table, chair, what do you mean? He said, no. I, you know, he said, no, I think the comedy of this is to play it very small. It's very real. It's got to be very real. During rehearsal, I didn't uh, put any moves on the character, the epileptic moves. I was saving it for camera because I was afraid I'd break every bone in my body. I mean, it was quite a shake-up, you know. We get in front of the audience and the scene starts. He took the set apart. I mean, he broke bookshelves. What's he knocked guy? over lamps. He ripped the, the leg of the couch off. <laughs> There was a sweater. Yeah. Right. Wear a sweater. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> which, which, what are you doing? Which was always Michael. You never knew what he was going to do until you got there. Well, hey. Enjoy the game. Yeah. Uh, I think you better take off the Orioles cap. Yeah, I better. <laughs> no, 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 seriously, you're in the owner's box. I don't think it's a good idea. You're not serious. Yes, 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 I am. Well, didn't he say that? No, no, but he gave me the seats. And I don't think he'd like it if you wore an Oreos cap. Yeah, well, maybe you should ask I him. I don't have to ask him. Now, are you going to take the hat off or not? So Larry David asked me if I had any, any connections for seats at Anaheim. I said, yeah, I might. I know Gene Autry's accountant. He's a good friend. He said, see if you can get me some tickets. So I call Stan Schneider, the accountant, and I said, listen, can you help me out with for Larry David for a couple of tickets? He says, yeah, I'll get you Gene's tickets in Gene Autry's box. And I took a friend of mine who was wearing a uh, Yankees cap. And it's around the third or fourth inning, and all of a sudden, one of the Angels executives comes down, taps my friend on the shoulder, and says, you got to take that hat off. Mr. Autry doesn't like it if, if people are wearing uh, uh, Yankee caps. I, I thought that was the most astounding thing I ever heard. So, uh, of course, I put it in an episode. I sense great vulnerability. A man-child crying out for love, an innocent orphan in the postmodern world. I see a parasite. <laughs> I just thought that poster picture was awful looking. But people bought it, and um, I remember the painting. I wanted the painting. I don't know what happened to it. The parking space, I mean, this, this happens every, every day in New York. People fight over these spaces for life. It's like life and death. And there's because they're so hard to come by. So um, it seemed like a natural for George to be involved in a, uh, in a parking space incident. Well, look at this guy. Are you crazy? What are you doing? Hey! Hey! 
You're stealing my space! George, wait, you don't know who this guy is? People kill for a parking space in this city. No, 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 he's not getting away no, with this. George! Hey, what are you doing? I think I'm parking my car. You can't do that. You can't just sneak in from the back like that. I'm not sneaking. I, I didn't even know you were parking. You were just sitting there three spaces up. Well, if you didn't think I was parking, why did you put it in head first? Well, that's the way I park! What, what I like to do is, 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 have, uh, is give each side a case, and if one is way too heavily, I'll try and reduce theirs a little bit and build up the other one. So, the, so half the audience will be on one side and half will be on the other side about who's right and who's wrong. The interesting thing about that show is we actually set up an audience section outside these three little storefronts, maybe 100 people, 150 people, and I think it was the first time I've ever known about where we try to make it like a normal sitcom and have an audience show. So we just had people coming and sitting for a little while, an hour or so, and I think it took us four or five hours to do the scene. Uh, it didn't work very well because you, the actors couldn't hear the response from the, from the uh, audience. It started out in daylight. It took so long to shoot the show that we ended up finishing the show at night. And you can actually see it. I think actually it helped the storyline a little bit at the end. Of course, the person who's backing up, it's really his space. The one going in frontward, it, it, that, it's not his space. So uh, it, uh, George was right in this case. Murphy Brown. What? <laughs> By Elaine Bennis? What? Elaine's writing a Murphy Brown? <laughs> Let me see this. Give me a second. Just look at it. Let me just look at it. Wait, just just look at it. Uh, give me a half. Right here. here. <laughs> Why didn't she tell us? Elaine is writing a sitcom? <laughs> In the episode of The Keys, the idea was that Kramer would move out to California to become an actor. This was his dream. And that he would eventually get cast in a show. And wouldn't it be great to see him on that show? And for some reason, I don't remember exactly how the show was chosen, but we decided Murphy Brown was the perfect show for him to be on. Oh, I know why. Because Murphy Brown had a weekly receptionist. Uh, as a cameo each week. A different person would be the receptionist. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if Kramer was that receptionist this one week? And NBC was a little red reticent. They wondered if there was a way to do it with an NBC show. It wouldn't work with an NBC show. They eventually were supportive of the idea. We went to, uh, uh, to Murphy Brown people. They were incredibly supportive. And we actually shot uh, a, a scene from Murphy Brown with Kramer as the receptionist on the Murphy Brown set that was used on the Seinfeld show. Elaine, Elaine, it's Kramer! Kramer's on Murphy Brown! <laughs> Hi, I'm Murphy Brown. You must be my new secretary. Oh, good morning, uh, Miss Brown. And you are? Uh, I'm uh, Stephen Snell. Snell. Yes. Well, uh, hello, Mr. Snell. Stephen. Stephen. Yes. Are you familiar with this computer system? Oh, I'm familiar, yes. Stephen Snell, I know people, and I have a very good feeling about you. I was looking at the camera a little bit, you know, and typing, you know, it's unrealistic. <laughs> Just sort of making it all up, you know. Oh, yes, I'm in Hollywood. I played it more like he's not really an actor. He's just, look, <laughs> I'm in front of a camera. <laughs> That's really how I played the part. Because <laughs> he's a terrible actor. Kramer is an awful actor. Peter Bronner's was directing that episode over there of Murphy Brown, and Diane English was the executive producer, and Debbie Smith was the producer. They're all friends of ours. Everyone was very accommodating, very open, and uh, I don't know what they thought of how I was playing my part. Candace uh, was, was very pleasant and, and did exactly what we needed. I thought Candace didn't like me or something. She, we waited and waited, and I was sitting there, and I just kept rehearsing this. Yeah, that's good. Maybe I'll do it like this. Maybe do it. We waited and waited and waited, and then when she came, we shot it, and then she was gone. Over and I remember Larry and I going onto the set of Murphy Brown and being very impressed. 
of like this is what a real show is like. It felt very professional, very uh, felt like we were on the set of a TV show. These were actors they were preparing. It's not like our little, you know, show with the curtain with the patch sewn onto it, you know, <laughs> that you just uh, hung over the garage and, and, and put on your own. That, that's, that's what we felt we were doing. We all felt like we were a bunch of clowns. <laughs> we felt we were doing an amateurish version of, of, a, of a real network sitcom. And we kind of aspired to be a real show. We thought Murphy Brown was a real show. And, uh, you know, with big stars and really organized crew and everything seemed very professional and they had like good food at the craft service. It may have been the year, the, the year before or the year that uh, Dan Quayle had made the famous pronouncement about Murphy Brown. And so the, that show was in the midst of the controversy at that point, you know. So, and, but, but Candace Bergen and all the people who worked there were great, you know, and they were very supportive. And it worked out great. And it, again, it wasn't done. And that was one of the things with Larry, you know, he would not cooperate with NBC when they wanted to do like a night of blackout episodes. You know, he wouldn't do that. But this was like just organically, creatively an exciting idea. And so he supported that idea. I believe it was subsequent to that that uh, Diane English asked Jerry and Larry to show Seinfeld now somewhat more of a success uh, to, in effect, return the favor, and they did a cameo appearance as themselves on her series Love and War. Somewhat analogous situation, one of their characters on Love and War wrote a spec Seinfeld script, and, um, and, and the, the, the little postscript scene in Love and War showed the script uh, being considered by Jerry and Larry in their offices. It's really starting to get to me. I'm really sick of this. I can't believe how many of these we get. I really think frazzled lately, have you noticed? Really. Yeah, this is, that's real funny. <laughs> Did you see this by Andrew Barton? Andrew Barton? Yeah. He's big time, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. That's that writer. Yeah, I heard of him. He's wrote a script? Andrew Barton wrote a script? Kramer sleeps with Elaine. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, that's yeah. real good. <laughs> Kramer sleeps with Elaine. Yeah. yeah. I really want to use that. Yeah. Different, though. It is. You would never expect anything. No, it's yeah. kind of unexpected. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Andrew Barton. Yeah.